If you like this channel and what I do here, please help to support my work by checking out one of my books, available from Lulu Publishing and Amazon.com. Thank you. Hi folks, Carl James here from Electric Media Madness, joined again today by Andrew Johnson, good friend and uh, fellow alternative knowledge researcher. How are you doing? Uh, not too bad overall, Carl. I'm glad good, we're good. able to do this again. Yes, very much so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before we get going, I just want to remind people if they want to check out Andrew's work, uh, two principal websites, checktheevidence.com and cvpandemicinvestigation.com. Huge amount of highly detailed and meticulously researched uh, data there. We're very much worth taking, taking the time to check out. It's, um, and it's relevant to what we're going to be talking about tonight as well. Um, but it might sound a bit strange. You know, we do these things. We talk about science fiction, but it's something that we share an interest in another series this time is Babylon 5. Um, we're going to be looking at three episodes, um, the finale of season two, Fall of Night, the finale of season three, Zahadum, and a wonderful little episode, a very dark episode, actually, but uh, mm. a, a fascinating episode from season four called Intersections in Real Time. A, a great title, really good title mm. for an episode that is. But anyway, um, and whereas in our previous video, we were talking about the, the plot and how it pertains to things that you and I have researched and things like that. And the, just of the general world of being an alternative knowledge researcher, this, this is much more um, not so much about the story, but it's much more about the themes and the sort of mm. generic ideas and metaphors yeah. and that kind of thing. And um, there's some incredible dialogue in it, which we're, we're going to go through as well. Um, so, yeah, um, unless there's anything else to say at that point, we may as well jump uh, it, oh, well, what, yeah, the other thing I, I mean, wanted to, to say as well, first of all, as well, uh, hopefully we will get into some of it in this video. But if we do run short of time, there is another video on my channel, Electric Media Madness, mm -hmm. which I've done recently uh, in the weeds. Episode three, I think it is, which is uh, Babylon 5, The Truth Revealed. And I kind of go into a, a lot more of the generic themes overall of the series. Uh, J. Michael Straczynski. One of the things that I find really fascinating about Babylon 5 is I, I'm interested in the auteur television and filmmaking so people that really very much take the lead with with the tv show and whereas we talked about star trek voyager being we can't always nail down exactly who wrote what this show you very much can it's 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 j michael straczynski's baby he 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 wrote most of the episodes you know he he was a showrunner he was you know so if there's anybody to blame it's it's him <laughs> you know what to give the credit to as it were but uh, yeah sorry go on andrew yeah no, I was just going to really sort of say that it is more the themes that we're talking about, mm. and um, I think um, you know if you if you consider some of the concepts in Voyager sort of highbrow, um, then I think in Babylon Five it's higher brow even than that. Some of it, certainly a couple of things that we're probably going to mention in this discussion, which are kind of very highbrow really, and and kind of make me think well. I'm surprised that was in there, really, because yeah. I didn't really think there were that many people thinking like that, writing TV scripts or TV shows. But we'll come on to that anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I principally took away from this two or three overarching themes to a lot of the series. One is this idea of um, control and conformity and this sort of these powers that be working. And that's actually another thing, but I'll come to that in a second, this idea of on earth you have this um this agenda that's moving forward this conspiracy and you have a, a deposed president who was assassinated taken over by this dictatorial uh, chap president clark who's formed like the ministry of peace the ministry of truth the night watch i mean all of these things are cribbed from things like orwell's 1984 mm -hmm. and and themes from things like the prisoner and blake seven and stuff like J. marcus Straczynski was a big big fan of those those types of shows um, so you've got that kind of thing going on and you see the characters in the universe very much battling against that and trying to sort of say, no, this is wrong. If this is a takeover, it's not, you're taking our freedom away. And then you have another theme of, um, much more above that is these very sort of in the shadows, powerful entities, these, these, you know, whatever they are. I mean, in the case of this series, it's the shadows and the Vorlons who are manipulating things, manipulating everybody across the field for thousands of years. And you could either look upon that on the level of the way the world, the, as we know it in this world, where you have these elite types who are sort of lording over the masses and controlling the money and the power structures and all that kind of thing, governments and everything. Or you can even look upon it like, like extraterrestrials maybe, 
um, and uh, or extra dimensional entities and things like that. You know, that all that all that kind of thing. You know, that how the, how that has an influence on. You know, is there much something much much higher than that? And that's something you've you've looked at a great deal. It's something I'm interested in as well. But so it does function on both levels with that as well. So yeah. Mm. yeah i mean that's that's kind of what i was meaning really and uh i think you know you put that very well and uh you know i think it would, for, for people that are not familiar with babylon 5 mm. um We're giving them a yeah yeah you know you do need to watch a few episodes to kind of get into the swing of it and what it's about mm. um as i think i may have commented i think we probably mentioned b5 in the last uh video that we did and i think we did yeah, i think yeah. i think somebody came up with the the uh you know the, the phrase that it was kind of like star trek for grown-ups or science fiction for grown-ups kind of thing and it is um you know there are some adult concepts which you wouldn't you know and i mean uh, you wouldn't really get and, and some of it again i get more now 20 years after i originally oh, yes. watched it yeah yeah I mean, because yeah. you know back then um you know i knew about uh you know, so, but most people have heard of the Nazi regime and there mm -hmm. are certain parallels, as, as Carl said, you know, to, to be drawn with that. But it, it kind of goes deeper than that and, and it's less prosaic than that as well in yes. some areas. So that's, you know, I didn't really have that much of an awareness until probably the last 15 years when I started to become aware of some of those wider issues Um you know, and yeah, so, so anyway, why, what, what do you want to um, sort of start off the first? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm guided by you, basically. Yeah, I've OK. Here, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got a very quick synopsis of the episode for mm. people. And just to make people aware, it's very much a story arc series, Babylon mm. 5. So it's not as easy to dip into episodically as Star Trek is. Uh, it does have an episodic, episodic formula in the early seasons, but it does very much become episode upon episode story art all the way through so you have these battles between various alien races in the galaxy and that is the backdrop to the series is like mm. um it's chaos things are falling apart and it's about these key characters and principally this station are trying to sort of keep it all together and trying to sort of come out the other side of it in in a better place basically instead of falling into darkness and chaos and you you do see this with this first episode fall of night so the, the plot's synopsis in brief is Two officials from the Ministry of Peace on Earth come to Babylon 5. One is called Mr. Lance. Um, he comes to deal with the Centauri race and their continued military expansion across the galaxy. And then there's Mr. Wells, who's uh, like the, the, group, the group leader of the Night Watch for that area. He's come to the station to check in on the local contingents of the Night Watch that are starting to make their presence known on Babylon 5 as well. Uh, then we have this Narn heavy cruiser spaceship and the Narn and the Centauri have briefly ju just recently ended their war. So this Narn ship turns up and it's seeking sanctuary at the station. Captain Sheridan grants the sanctuary to the ship, um, but the Centauri learn about this and they dispatch a warship to the station to destroy the Narn cruiser. Um, there's this firefight and Babylon 5 basically takes out the Centauri ship, allowing the Narn ship to escape. Um, and the Ministry of Peace representatives, they're furious about this. And they order Sheridan to make a public apology for what he's done, even though he doesn't feel there was a need to make an apology. But, you know, uh, so much to his eye, he's like, yeah, I will. Um, so they decide that they're going to have this apology in the garden, the Zen garden in the station. And whilst he's on his way there, he's in a shuttle bus and there's a Centauri who plants a bomb in the bus to kill him, basically. And before it explodes, Sheridan jumps out the shuttle bus and he's floating in zero G in the center of the station coming down. He's got minutes basically before they can rescue him. They haven't got the time to do it. And realizing that he's moments away from death, the Vorlon ambassador Kosh, who's been hidden inside this encounter suit for up to this point in the series, he find and he says, I can't come out this suit because if I do, I'll be recognized by everybody. That's the line that he's been saying through the series. Mm -hmm. So he finally comes out of the suit and it reveals like this angelic being of light, like an angel with wings and that, and catches Sheridan in midair, brings him down to the ground and saves his life. And we'll come back to that shortly, that, that theme of that. Uh, there's one little side plot to this episode where we have uh, the Star Fury pilot, Keffer, and he's tracking a shadow ship in hyperspace. And he tries to sort of monitor it and record it. And as a result of doing so, he gets destroyed by the shadow ship, but that's sort of making the presence known of the shadows and the ball on. So that, that really is it for that, for that episode. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you want and to I leave think, from I there think, then yet. Well, yeah. I mean, I was just going to say that I think if you're watching the, the sort of series at this point, this is the point where 
it really sort of becomes defined that what the forces of good and evil yes are yeah you know sort of coming to the fore and you 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 know you, you you've been gradually led towards them being identified more and more clearly because mm. i think there's a point earlier on in the series where you're not quite sure if the Vorlons really are the good guys you kind of think they are mm. but you but know there's, a, the there's ways... a spin put on that in the in the there next is. episode where exactly it's not yeah. as black and white as you think it is no, yeah, 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 no yeah. no and that 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 theme is returned to i think mm -hmm. in the next episode we're going to discuss it. yeah but well, we bit. can come to that yeah 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 so yeah, so so yeah, that that was just all I wanted to add, really. And um, mm. I don't know whether you wanted to sort of p pick out any bits of dialogue or story plots. Yeah, or whatever, I mean, before we, yeah, before we do, I mean, it just the themes that I took out of this is ethereal beings appearing to the masses, yep. um, yeah. and in such a way as they would find favourable. You know, each according to their yeah. type was the line of dialogue in this. You know how they appear to others, and then yeah. there's others who don't see anything at all, like Londo. He says, "I saw nothing." You know, he's going down this dark path. So is that the reason why mm -hmm. he didn't see anything? Um, mm -hmm. The Night Watch Ministry of Peace encroaching everywhere, bribing, trying to bribe people into positions of power, arresting local yep. shopkeepers for having an opinion on things that are going on in the world. We can come to that. Um, mm -hmm. And generally this idea of figures of authority um, having to conform and public, uh, publicly apologise in order mm. to align themselves with what's politically convenient or politically mm. correct. So that's, mm. I mean, that's stuff that's going on in the world now, you know, so we can. Oh we yeah. Can I mean, that as well. watching, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's very clear parallels to what's been happening. And yeah, absolutely. I said that in my yeah. previous video about Babylon 5. It's, mm. it's, I, I was, I was amazed on a recent rewatch of it, how much it still is relevant, you know, very much so. So any dialogue that you wanted to sort of come, go through or anything like that? I've got, yeah, yeah, there was a couple, couple, couple of bits, um, you know, not a massive amount that I picked up on, so you might have picked up a little bit more. But um, th this Night Watch group, which is clearly, mm. uh, you know, a, um, and I don't think I really fully appreciated this in the first watch when I watched it years ago. I kind of did a bit, but I, I, um, I maybe my memory was hazy, but they're like the sort of secret police Stasi. And they're clearly sort of, uh, as you said in the in your introduction, coming on to Babylon 5 at this time in the storyline because uh, they realise that Babylon 5 is a key, you know, Very sort much of so, area yeah. Yeah. In, in, in this negotiation and this, um, you know, these agreements which are being made between the, uh, you know, the humans and the Centauri who, who seem to have suddenly got this, this military power from somewhere which, you know, you've been shown what that is. And it's, of course, it's the, it's the shadows, London, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. London's made a deal with the shadows. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so when so when this um, this Mr. Wells uh, guy, uh, he comes and he, he, he's having a having a chat with the one of the security officers uh, who's called um, uh, Zach, Al Zach Allen, I think, isn't yeah, it? He's, yeah, yeah. Kanicki from Greece. <laughs> Played Kanicki in Greece for those did people. Did he? Who I, I, yeah, world, I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> Many years ago, yeah. <laughs> and um yeah and 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 this wells guy says uh sedition comes in small packages as well oh, as yes. large ones yeah 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 you yeah. know and i think the really key line that i picked out when he's talking to zach allen where he's sort of saying well look you know we know that you don't really like spying on people because that's not what you're about you just want to keep order you don't really bother yeah. what people are doing unless you know they're, they're they're smashing the place up or yeah yeah you know, you know, interfering with others or going around shooting people. Yeah. Other than that, you don't really care because that's, you know, the, 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 that's what the, the ordinary police are like. You know, they just want the, the ordinary police in in the, in the UK and in the US and other similar countries. They all they want to do is just let you get on with your life. And if you you you, yeah. you know, causing trouble, you you know, smashing somebody's windows in, or you're breaking something, or you're smashing up property. A proper That's criminal they, intent, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, prop, yeah. Proper criminal intent, uh, criminal uh, intent, etc. Um, and it, and with the key line he said was this Wells guy, the secret police guy, who essentially what that's what he is, says, how can we tell the innocent bystanders from the real troublemakers unless we are kept informed? Yeah. yeah. So he's making the argument that they need to keep tabs on people in case mm. they're terrorists, basically, which, of course, yeah. was yeah, yeah. what the Patriot Act was for in uh, Absolutely. 2001. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and the terrorist, Terrorism Act in the UK in 2000, that was really... Uh, to me, what that line was yes, yeah. describing yeah. this excuse. Oh, we know there's dodgy people around doing dodgy stuff, you know, we, we want to keep tabs on them. 
and of course the way that um zach allen the security guy the way he's put a backed into a corner and i mean he's he's a smart enough guy but he's not that smart you know he's only yeah. Sort of regular yeah i mean he does get it eventually but uh in yeah. the series but obviously at this point yeah yeah but he doesn't have the sort of intellectual comeback to say hang on a minute you know that's that's uh you know that, that that's we're not going to be secret police. You know we're just keeping order. He doesn't come back with that, and he also gets backed into a corner that he has to fess up that he knew this guy who's been, um, you know, told um, uh, that he's been saying bad thing, bad mouth in the new president, or whatever, on the new regime. He he knew about that, but he didn't really care, and he didn't bother writing it down or anything. So he he essentially gets wrapped over the knuckles yeah. by this uh, this. Um, uh, Wells guy in front of all his the rest of his staff saying, "Oh, you've been a naughty boy, haven't you? Because yeah, yeah, you yeah. haven't you haven't kept tabs on people." And uh, I think this is probably how they do it in 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 the police. You know, they'll have a group of them, mm -hmm. and they'll say, "You know, this is what you should be doing." And if you're oh, not yeah, doing, yeah. you're you're you know, you're not doing your job properly. Yeah, uh, that whole it, scene is quite well. Engineered. It reminded me of the sort of NLP stuff and the yeah. um, unconscious bias training that they do now in so many in the media and the police and, yeah. um, you know, NGO groups and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it was interesting watching the, the other people in the meeting, they were all kind of sitting there very quietly looking at him. You know, it's like this, um, uh, conf the conformity, the idea of the group, you know, the group thing. Mm. So uh, watching him very, very intently to see where he's going to go with this Zach Allen. And it makes him uncomfortable as well. Doesn't it? Mm, it does. Yeah. He's very uncomfortable. <clears throat> So it's very well, you know, sort of um, choreographed scene and, and very well played by all the actors, you know. It's, yeah. uh, it's, uh, sorry, go on. I was just saying, you know, so when you stop and think about these things and the subtleties, it's good how, the, you know, the director's directed and the actors have acted it and the script mm. is, you know, and it works, work, you, you can, it's like, it's real, you know, it's very, that's the thing about Babylon 5 generally, it's got yeah. probably more realism to it than a lot of the other science fiction as 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 you know you were saying in the intro a bit like blake seven there was elements of that which had a mm, mm. gritty realism to them yeah which kind of I, I find it staggering i don't want to go into this too much because i've sort of covered it in the other video i did already mm, but yeah, yeah, i find it bizarre how j j marcus straczynski has backtracked from it so much and and sort of said you know well what's in the real world is totally different from what you see on a television program yeah. and how can you possibly equate the two together and that, you know, it's, it's, that's fiction, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, mm. what, you know, what, well, it's almost like somebody's giving him a talking to, or he's, uh, yeah. you know, but I, I, you know, these things are relevant because one of the things that I oh, took yeah. from it was, um, if I can find it in my notes, just bear with me a second is when they had that meeting you were talking about, um, and Mr. Wells says to him, uh, potentially disloyal acts on the part of a yep. store owner, one Mr. Yep. Xavier Darabuto and all that. And, and mm -hmm. Zach says, well, he just thought that the new regulations on the imports were a little bit nuts, but I don't think he, and then he kind of just jumps in, Wells does. And he says, like you say, sedition comes in small packages as well as large ones. Now, perhaps mm -hmm. this store owner is nothing more than a vaguely dissatisfied citizen. That's so right. how can we tell the real troublemakers from the innocent bystanders when we're not informed? And, mm -hmm. um, and he says, well, I thought we could exercise our own discretion. He goes, of course you can. But it exists to protect people from misinformation and harmful right. ideas. And I was thinking, there but for the grace of God, you know, that's today. That's people informing on people for, for staying open with their businesses and during the lockdown and that, you know. We've seen it happen. We've, people, we have. The police have turned up to shops and, you know, well, it's my right. It's my inalienable human rights to, yeah. to run my business. You can't shut me down. And they say, well, we've had a report from... Da, da, da. And you're thinking that's that's the you know somebody down the street has shot them. It's crazy, yeah. and it, it <laughs> is. Know. And I mean, you know, it, it's even crazier than the scenario in, in the Babylon Five episode because what's happened now is you, just by the act of opening, you don't yeah, have to exactly. say anything yeah, or yeah. do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just by the act of opening, so it's even more crazy, you know. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and the little coda to this episode as well is you at the end of the episode you see the local night watch arrest him put the yeah, shutters right. down on the shop and put up this board, this pin poster thing, which, um, let me see if I can Close find what it says. pending allegations of sedition. sedition yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You know. And I thought, wow, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't write these. Well, somebody did, but, and years before as well. I mean, I mean, naturally these things have always gone on in history, 
you know, to yeah. varying degrees and various yeah, parts yeah, of the yeah. world and that. I mean, history is cyclic, you know, but I think with this one, it's, um, I think, you know, just to go down the rabbit hole for a, few, for a moment or two, it's just that I think what bothers me about all of this more than anything else is you always, with any of historical event that's ever happened, it's always been like located to a specific part of the world and that's it. I think I might be wrong in thinking this, but this is, to my knowledge, is the first time when this has been global. So mm -hmm. what's what's going on here? Yeah. There's nowhere to run and hide from it. Wherever you go, I, you've got the same, you know, I know there are states yeah. in America that are fighting it and certain, you know, but it's it's pretty much a global thing. I mean, the other thing that he says in that conversation is those ideas can be very subtle. You might not recognize them. So, you know, he's sort of saying, well, you know, I'm smarter than you and yeah. I know yeah. I know what's a harmful idea, Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and you might not. So I'm yeah. telling you that's why you need to spy on people because some of those ideas might be harmful. Yeah. You know, and, and, it, and it, of course it, it, this is put people in the fear state. And what I was also thinking while you were just saying there is, that, well, when we watch this, of course, we're rooting for people like Zach Allen and, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the, the people that are being targeted yeah but yeah. people watching this now are anybody thinking that uh, this uh, you know wells character is is the one they should be rooting for yeah. he is the one that you know is in the right for mm. proposing that uh, these people should yeah. be you know yeah. removed from their um you know jobs or or positions without any evidence and interrogated you know yeah. And the scary thing is, I don't want to be overly dramatic about this, but the scary thing is, is we, we live in a world now where so many people would would conform with that thinking of the Night Watch. They would be, like you say, yeah. they would be aligning themselves with Mr. Wells' thinking. Now keep everybody safe yeah. and all this clap yeah. clap, you know. Yeah, and then, yeah. You, you know, it's, yeah. I mean, thankfully, there are still, you know, a lot of people. I mean, it's it's been so, I've lost a lot of hope, you know, in recent in the last year but you know there's moments where i have been so you know just gen generically as a human being i have been so proud of the people that i have seen on the streets of london and and things like that you know and the work you've done mm. and so many other people have done i mean it could go on and on all the different people we could mention here you know um true it's amazing it really is it, it just makes me so proud to think that there's of these people and to think you know common sense and and you mm. know logic and all that isn't dead yet and I think, uh, you know, on that point there, I think it'd be interesting to know if you if you were able to do it and look at all those people who are like us and say, no, this is wrong, what's going on, you know, in various different ways. How many of them are Babylon 5 fans, you know, have watched it or have watched things like Babylon 5 or have read books that explore mm. similar themes? You know, what sort of percentage would be that be? Would it be a high percentage or is it just kind of not significant? I'd be quite interested to... I would be, yeah. To, yeah. to, to find that out, you know, yeah. whether it's just something that's innate in people and it hasn't really been, you know, affected much by the existence of things like Babylon 5 or like seven or, or whatever it is, you know, because I think for some reason, people like you and I, we identify with these themes that we're talking about very, very strongly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we, it's not, it's unclear why, you know, we do, because it's not as if we, you and I lived through, for example, the second world war. Well, that's it. Exactly. You know? Yeah. We're, no, and we, you know, we, we've we, not we, seen that level of tyranny no, in our lifetime, no, you know, it's... no, I mean, maybe it all comes from, you know, being aware of things like, um, you know, the, the nuclear threat of the 1970s and 1980s, which, of course, we did grow up with to a, a greater or lesser degree and becoming aware of why that threat existed. We, you know, we, we became aware of, of, of some of that um, because of but the, I, know, the... I really wasn't, though. I was, yeah, I, it didn't really register with me when I was young. Mm. So that, I, I, I know I understand what you're saying, but for, for me, even that you wasn't... I to, yeah, okay. I think I was alive at the time, but I, I was very much sort of... I, it wasn't something that I was aware that of. You yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I think for yeah. me, it's it is principally because of the fact that I have read, um, you know, a lot of sort of dictatorial mm. dystopian science fiction and watched a lot of things right. like that. But also, what's worth mentioning as well, actually, and I, I don't know what kind of, you know, the exact detail of the studies that he did, but I mean, I have a lot of questions about the chap myself anyway, Aldous Huxley. Mm. Sooner or later, you have to bring in an element of persuasion, an element of, of getting people to consent to what is happening to them. 
the nature of the ultimate revolution with which we are now faced is precisely this, uh, that we are in process of developing a whole series of techniques which uh, will enable the controlling oligarchy, who have always existed and presumably always will exist, uh, to get people actually to love their servitude. Uh, th this is the, seems to me the, the ultimate uh, in malevolent revolution, shall we say, uh, to think about these other methods uh, of control, the, these um, non-violent methods. And my, I'm inclined to think that uh, the scientific dictatorships of the future, and I think there are going to be scientific dictatorships in many parts of the world, will be probably a good deal nearer to the brave new world pattern uh, than to the uh, 1984 pattern. They will be a good deal nearer, not because of any humanitarian qualms in the scientific dictators, but simply because the brave new world pattern is probably a good deal more efficient than the other. That if you can uh, get people to consent to the state of affairs in which they are living, the state of servitude, the state of being, having their differences ironed out and being made uh, uh, amenable to mass production methods on the social level, if you can do this, then you have, uh, you are likely to have a much more stable and much more lasting society, uh, a much more easily controllable society than you would if you were relying wholly on clubs and firing squads and concentration camps. Pavlov, after all, made some extremely profound observations, both on animals and on human beings. And he found, among other things, that uh, uh, that uh, conditioning uh, techniques applied to animals or humans in a state either of psychological or of physical stress uh, sank in, so to say, very deeply into the mind body of the creature and were extremely difficult to get rid of, that they seem to be embedded more deeply than, than other forms of conditioning. The conditioning has been driven in, so to say, um, by a kind of psychological iontophoresis uh, into the very depth of the uh, people's being and has got so deep that it's very difficult for it ever to be rooted out. And uh, these uh, methods, I, I think, are a real refinement on the older methods of terror because they combine methods of terror with methods of uh, of uh, acceptance method that the, the person who he is subjected to a form of, of terroristic stress uh, but uh, for the purpose of inducing a kind of voluntary quotes um, acceptance of uh, the state and uh, the psychological state into which he has been driven and the state of affairs within which he finds himself the percentage of people who can be hypnotized with the utmost facility, just like that, uh, is about 20-20%. That about uh, a corresponding number at the other end of the scale are, are very, very difficult or almost impossible to hypnotize. And that in between there lies a, uh, the, a large mass of people who can, with more or less uh, difficulty, uh, be hypnotized. That, that, uh, they can gradually be, if you work hard enough at it, be, be got into the hypnotic state. The other end of the scale, you've got another roughly 25% of the people who are just the way their brains are wired. And I'm assuming I'm one of those people and you are as well, you know, is that you just seem to just recognize these things when they come around. And it just this instinctive feeling of just something's not right here. And then you obviously go further than that and research it and gather evidence and all that kind of thing. Um, what some people would call nonconformists, I suppose, but I don't, I think it's much deeper than that. But then he said, you've got this great big swathe of 50% of people in the middle or more that you, it's so easy to just nudge them one way or the other. And if the prevailing voices in the world, the mainstream media and all that, they're the loudest and they're the ones that get heard the most, this 50% in the middle, just, just go, go that way. So I, I think these people that we, you know, we talk about the people who are aware of these things going on and that, I think maybe it's, it's that as well. There's just something about the way certain people are wired, you know, it's just, yeah.
in their makeup yeah. just in there just is that is that a genetic thing is that a is that sort of like an akashic record type thing you know i don't i don't know mm-hmm. I, you know, I just don't know well you know you, you can relate it to various things like past live experiences mm-hmm. or you know uh various things like that you know but uh, it's, it's hard to put your finger mm-hmm. on sometimes yeah. isn't it so uh but it would be fascinating you're right it'd be fascinating to find out whether people mm-hmm. do whether that plays into it as well yeah yeah you know i know I mean, whether it's just sort of basic human conscience and a sense of you know right and wrong and uh, a moral yeah. compass yeah. you know which yeah. uh, apparently can be uh disrupted uh very easily yeah. substantially yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. so but yeah we'll talk probably a bit more about that as, as we come into mm-hmm. the next episode that we're going to discuss but um so so just um i'd written down a few more things yeah absolutely yeah. in relation to um you know because we talked about uh you talked about the you know the scene with sheridan falling out of the tram or d- j- jumping out of the tram and was in sort of semi-weightless thing coming mm. to his peril and the Vorlon, you know, et cetera, being the angel and stuff. Very, very, and I was kind of, when I first saw that scene, I was, I was kind of blown away really because yeah, um, it was, it was something I'd been thinking about that sort of theme, you know, and you get into the theme, well, what is God? What is an angel? Are there um, forces at work in the universe, which are non-corporeal mm-hmm. or, or, you know, have, an ability to use their bodies very differently to, to the way that we use our bodies, you know, these sort yeah. of semi-physical and non-physical beings. Yeah. And, and, and really, you know, this, this, this idea of the Vorlon and that scene essentially shows that the Vorlons are not corporeal beings or at that, least that's right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And you know, that, 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 that time, this, this isn't like in Star Trek where, um, you know, you get this non-corporeal being for one episode and it takes over the, the, the 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 crew member and then you know forces him to to to, to, to you know take the enterprise to another planet it's not like that cost no. has been there for i think two almost two series by then hasn't he it's always yeah, been a bit yeah. enigmatic and mysterious so you're actually you know you get this sense that this 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 kosh alien has been there and you know sort of enigmatically but now it's shown to you that is this is a different, very different type of being. It's a very different type of alien. It's not a Dalek. It's not. Mm, it's not. Mm. It's not. A, a, you know, an evil being in a, in, a, in a robotic thing, and it doesn't. It's not meant to look like a robot either, is he? You know, the, no, the, it's no, no. An encounter suit. It's, I think. it's almost organic looking anyway. It's. Um, it is. It is, and yeah. that that is brought out as and well. I think the I ships think are organic as well. I think the ships oh, are organic. Yeah, I mean, I was going to mention that later on. Oh yeah, yeah. I was going to mention that. And that comes up in the next mm. episode a bit. Yeah. And um, so that whole theme of Kosh being a non-corporeal being and, you know, this idea that they're actually one of the gods and this, this god is inside this suit yeah. and he's interacting with all these aliens and with Sheridan and Sinclair in the earlier series and so, mm. so forth. Mm. That whole concept kind of think, wow, you know, that's, that's a really, really interesting concept. You know, yeah. that he's put that in the storyline. Yeah. And that's, I think, what lifts it from being highbrow to kind of very highbrow, I suppose you might say. Mm, mm. And, and that, that whole idea, as you said in the introduction of them, the being appearing differently to each of the Individual. alien races that yeah. sees it. So what's yeah. that about? What, 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 yeah. That is another highbrow concept that people yeah. can see the same thing and perceive it totally differently. And that's made very, very clear in the story. Mm. Not at all. Well, they call them the, the, the names of their gods, don't they? They're Trishala and the Drazi one and that, and uh, whose light fills the world, uh, this religious icon that's that they've it. got. They, they think they've seen their, 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 the face of God, their God, basically. So, so where, did, where did he get that concept from? You know, who, <laughs> I think that was the first time I'd seen that concept set sort of written into any science fiction. And um, you, you then get into this idea of consciousness and, as I say, non-corporeal beings and this mm-hmm. idea of them interacting with us and this sort of thing and being even, you know, sort of caring about us. And um, maybe they're not actually caring about us as much as we think mm-hmm. might think. And as as and then I want the bit I wanted to mention was a scene towards the end of that episode, where Delane and Sheridan are discussing what happened and they're saying, "Oh yeah, everyone's talking about it." Yeah, I've got it here. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah go on. You know, and Delane says um, Delane's obviously pretty clued in because it, it seems like the Mimbari are a bit more advanced 
are a bit of an older race. I think aren't they, they and, allied themselves with the Vorlons in did. the last war, so they were they've obviously some history there and. That's you know, it. That so you get thing, to learn yeah. that in the story arc. Yeah, so yeah. the Mimbari are the Mimbari are corporeal beings, and in fact, one of the plot lines in one of the other episodes is that the reason why they stopped attacking uh, the Earth, yeah, because they found found that uh, Mimbari souls were being reborn in human yeah, bodies. Yeah, they were migrating out of the species and being reborn. Yeah, into, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, mean it's wow, yeah. Nice stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. I thought, bloody hell, that's yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. pretty. Yeah, and eyebrow stuff, you know, that's and, proper and that's, esoteric stuff. That is, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah. It is indeed. Yeah. yeah, and and so, um, you know, uh, I, they're, they're having this discussion, and Sheridan sort of says, "Oh, yeah," or um, Delenn says, "Oh, they've been guiding and manipulating the other races," and then Sheridan says, "Oh, we, we've programmed. They programmed them." They've programmed the races mm. so that when we saw them, we'd react the right way. The right way, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's a really interesting way yeah. of putting it. It's not just saying, yeah. oh, yeah, you know, they're they're here to help us and these are like godlike angelic beings, you know, and yeah. was, they're so wonderful and they're so good and they're yeah. so nice and they're so... He doesn't say that. He no. doesn't say that. No, and, and it's interesting how Delenn tight, puts a slight spin on it because she does say, it is, as you say, a, a matter of perspective. You know, because yeah. he says manipulated us, programmed us so that we would see them, we would react the right way. Yeah. And, so, and she's yeah. almost like slightly defending them, Dylan is at that moment in time. And yeah, she's yeah. not quite aware of the, the bigger picture of the the Vorlons at that point anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, and this and this is where you, I think, get to like the character of Sheridan more and more because he really is his own guy. Oh, yeah. He's know? questioning things. He's questions everything yeah. that he, he gets yeah. confronted with. You know, and, he, and he's got, a lot, he's, he's got, yeah. I mean, he's got a bit of humility as well. You know, I mean, he's he's a bit like he's a bit like uh, Kirk, but he's he's uh, you know, yeah, I thought that. But yeah. but he's got, you know, he's got a bit more humility about him, and he's a bit more. He's sort of you can see in some of the ways he reacts that he knows he's being manip manipulated yeah. into certain situations, yeah. particularly in that episode with, yeah. with the later one. But he also stands up for himself. Yeah. in a very powerful way. Yeah, you know, I and, find that uh, he um, he's one of these characters that I mean, I've always I'm always talking about like um, in life. Sometimes you you can't you. It's difficult to fight every fight. You have to pick your battles. You know, you have to pick where you yeah. you know where you where you're going to fall on your sword with these things. It's not a very good metaphor. I don't particularly like that one, but you know, and Sheridan does do that. This in the series, there are yeah. times where he says, I "I'm going to have to go along with this for a bit. I don't like it, but until a, a better." opportunity yeah. uh, option presents itself to me i'm gonna have to like and lump this sort of thing for a little while i'm still gonna voice my dis you know dis you know i <laughs> don't like this i'm not not happy about this one bit but yeah yeah and i, I like that about the character as well he's mm -hmm. like he he, he he waits to he doesn't just you know like a bull in a china shop just run in there you know no. He's very measured and very thoughtful about the way he yeah. does things, and yeah, and he's got a you know, certain amount of, you know, he's got intuition and he uses strategy as well, you know, yeah, in the way yeah, yeah, that, uh, yeah. you know, he deals with things. Yeah. So yeah, so you, so you, I think by the end of that episode, you really get, I think, oh yeah, these Vorlons, they're they're manipulating the the other the other <laughs> races. So yeah, yeah. yeah. What's that yeah. about? You know, so so you you don't you don't you know, it's not really just these these helper aliens. You know, it's more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and uh, which you very much get into that in in Zaha Doom, our second episode. That's right. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, unless there's anything else you wanted to say about uh, Fall of Night, we can we can. No, I think I think that. really like like you said, it was those are the main themes and. Um, the one other thing I did find quite interesting was when Mr. Wells was trying to uh, bribe Ivanova, you know, yeah, save a couple yeah, of years actually, of yeah. your career yeah, if you join yeah, us yeah, and all this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she says, I, I've had my eye on you lot for a while and what I saw worried me. And now you've just confirmed everything I've been worried about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was good. Yeah. That was a good line. Yeah. I mean, and again, another strong character. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and um, there's an interesting video. I don't know if you've seen her. Um, talk about she did it i think it was a ted talk you know do, have you seen that really i know i did not know yeah, that yeah no. yeah because she was an alcoholic you know oh yes Christian. yes i know she was yeah yeah i didn't know she did she, she did a te ted talk about how she got she got rid of it right yeah, yeah. and it's about this uh drug that she she was made aware of oh, i forget right. the exact name of it yeah i'll, I'll right. try and find you the links it's, oh that'd be interesting you know, again yeah, yeah you know what 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 i think interested me is that i think 
somebody like her, she's a highly intelligent person, you know, the act- actress, mm-hmm. very driven. Yeah, and that yeah. comes out in the in very much in the Ivanova character. Yeah. And um And what's you know, worth I, knowing as well for, for people who aren't perhaps familiar with this who are watching this video is that uh Jay Michael Straczynski was very much influenced by the personality of the, of the actors with these characters. Although he had b- broad guidelines for the for the character layout and their arc, their story. He, he used the, the personalities of the actors to inform the characters. So there's a lot of, of, of um, Claudia Christian in Ivanova. Same with mm. most of the other characters in the show. He, he was very good at watching them, as Straczynski was. He, was, he mm. watched them, the way they interacted, their, their sort of worldviews and things like that, and took a lot of, used a lot of that. He, he you know, um, plagiarized it, but in the right way, <laughs> you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that I, I I noticed that scene as well, and again, it was, you know, she 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 demonstrated that she was a strong person who was basically loyal to Sheridan. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know knew they were both you know on the righteous side, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then. So if there's anything else, I think we've pretty much covered that. Then I think so. Um, yeah, it's, it's a it's a great little episode. I mean, I think it it's is. probably the weaker of the three in terms of the the much bigger sort of spectacle and um but still mm. a lot of really really fascinating ideas there it's um mm. really mm. thoughtful so zaha doom this was a biggie i mean even outside of the context of how we're looking at these episodes mm. just from a, a a babylon 5 fan perspective sci-fi perspective this was the biggie this episode was in, was, the, in yeah. the story of uh, the entire story arc of the series mm. um i remember at the time being a um a buyer of various science fiction magazines and that and everyone was trying to get spoilers on it and they thought because they knew the the title episode was Zaha Doom and everybody thought oh this is going to be this great big space battle between the shadows and da-da. and it's not that at all this is a really quiet episode it, it and it's a big info dump on the whole notion of the, mm. the shadows and the Vorlons it just it really just drops the you know the the the, the, the game as it is lays it out for you there so it does yeah um, right there so just a quick synopsis on this one. Then we have Anna mm. Sheridan, uh, the believed to be dead wife of John Sheridan. And he's been trying to get over her death a couple of years before. She just suddenly turns up alive on Babylon 5. Mm-hmm. And she tells Sheridan that she's actually been on Zahadun, the homeworld of the, of the shadows, the powerful and ancient race of the series. Um, he thought he knew that she went there initially. He thought she died when the ship exploded. But then Mr. Morden turned up earlier in the series. So that raised the question of whether she might actually be alive or not. Certainly he was interested in how it is that Mr. Morden was alive, but his wife was death, dead. So that was something that, that played through that. Um, but Anna gives uh, Sheridan an ultimatum, basically. And she says to him, uh, come back with her to Zahadun or never know what happened to her while she was there. So he agrees to go. Um, but there are some little twists in the story of there with that. Oh, yeah. Like, carried a couple of nuclear bombs on the white star with him yeah. just in case he goes wrong, you know, um, uh, I brought but, a pic- picnic with me, Anna, yeah, I brought know, a picnic uh, it's... in the boot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite hot, but yeah. blow your stomach apart. That one will. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he arrives there with Anna and he meets Justin, who I've put here as a proverbial middleman representing the control agenda of the shadows. That's, generally the way I describe the character and Mm -hmm. their agenda is revealed and we'll come to that shortly. Mm -hmm. And as it's coming towards the conclusion of the conversation, we see this shadow creature come up behind one of the shadows comes up behind Sheridan and he shoots and then he escapes. And then he ultimately you find him surrounded by shadows on this sort of balcony and Anna Sheridan's there. And she's like, you know, I've changed, but I'm not the original Anna anymore, but I can still love you. It's like invasion of the body snatcher type stuff. You know, we're talking mm-hmm. about the pod people in our previous discussion. It's almost like that again, you know. Um, but he says, no, nope, not having any of that. So he calls down the white star on his little thing, you know, and uh, detonates a couple of <laughs> thermonuclear devices and just yeah. wipes out the city. But before he does that, he jumps into this great big giant hole, this black pit. And I've got some thoughts on that, on that imagery, you know, the abyss and all that kind of thing as well, but uh, yeah. which is underneath the city. And that's where the episode mm. ends. Um, mm. So my themes for this one were really the powerful forces of all under the shadows, manipulating and controlling the masses behind the scenes. We've said about that. Um, 
this could be taken as a metaphor a for for the various cabals of human elite types of the world i did said about this in my previous video there's a lot of researchers that do believe that there's a tug of war behind the scenes of the you know the global agenda for want of a better way of putting it as i always call it in this world and i i almost like if i was to look at the world i would say it was almost like what we saw in the world after 9 11 was the shadows and what we're seeing in the world now is the volons you know order control stay inside behave yourself be a good little kid you know behave your parents where post 9 11 it was just chaos war everywhere you know let's just the whole world so I, I almost do see that in society sometimes you know it's almost like there are shifting power structures sometimes in the world you know with their agendas they all generally tend to agree on the same things you know control the masses control the you know but they've got different ideas on how to go about it sometimes but that's that's neither here nor there but that was a thought i had with it then and to extend that idea as well we talked about these controlling forces you know whether that would be et's extra dimensional entities that sort of stuff so yeah shaping our you know, and it's almost like energy ed energetic consciousness as well you know we i've talked about that in many of my talks and that um this idea of uh, energy and consciousness and the Vorlons are very much like that as well, aren't they? In their, sort of their, their, how they are, how they take form and all that. Oh yeah. So yeah. So that was, that's my thoughts on that then. So if you want to lead the way then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it is a, a very sort of taut episode and the, uh, you know, this whole thing of his wife uh, materializing on the station, you kind of think, well, how did she get there and stuff, you know, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's not explained, but what I think was interesting was thinking about the, the the idea that they know that Sheridan is a key player in what everything that's going on. So, you know, he's not portrayed as any type of messiah or anything like that. But yeah. you, you know, you then you then the other of these themes that comes in to the storyline at various points with several of the characters is this idea of destiny and you know, are people destined to participate in certain events? Absolutely, and yeah. I want. Yeah. You know, and I want to reference Wilbert Smith, you know, well, both with that concept, yeah, because yeah. that's something he talked about he did, in yeah. the 1950s. Uh, and I've talked about that in some of the, talk, the talks that I've done. He actually said in, in his 1958 address, people come here to participate in certain events. And uh, that that theme is very much brought out in, in the storyline with with the characters participating in, you know, huge sort of cosmic scale events, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they have a role to play. And that, and that I think is particularly played out in this episode, both with Sheridan and Delane, yeah. and I suppose, you know, the, the darker characters like Morden and Anna Sheridan, um, and also um, Gary Baldy as well at the end yeah, of the absolutely. episode, what happens to him. Yeah. Um, so, so, so this idea of people you know being in a certain point in time and history to play a role you know that that i think is a key concept in this whole story arc but particularly in this episode even more strongly perhaps mm. um and um we're also there's you know the sort of backstories that are revealed like delenn uh knows what happened to anna sheridan but she hasn't told sheridan she only told him a bit that's right yeah. because because you know, they were worried that, that Sheridan would try and go to Zaha yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and do stuff, you know, and he, and he's furious, you know, so she confronts him. They have this conversation. He says, what you knew and you didn't tell me. And yeah. you know, she's, she's furious. So again, Sheridan sort of knows that he's being manipulated, but I think quite quickly he realizes that Delaney is doing it for, for good reason. She's not trying to, no. you know, it's because the stakes are much higher, aren't they? Than yeah, just she, she, it's not just about words, the woman he loves. You know, yeah, it's about D Delenn a knows much a bit more thing. about. Yeah, I mean, Delenn knows a bit more about the bigger picture than Sheridan yeah, does. Yeah, and uh, she she self regrets, you know, that she's caught in it in the way that she is because mm. she's, you know, she's in love with Sheridan. Yeah, and that that I think is it also comes out very well in the story. It, it does, yeah, yeah. And then the the other thing about how they find the, the Zaha Doom homeworld, you know, that's quite an interesting little yes. turn of the plot. Yeah, I forgot about it's that one. Because, yes. Oh yeah, and 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 they say because Anna Anna Sheridan, he, you know, he's, they're having this Sheridan, Sheridan and his wife are having this conversation. So uh, what? How did you get to Zaha Doom? And he says, well, you know, it was basically through a black program. She doesn't call yeah. it that, but she gets involved in a black program because yeah, they yeah. found this alien ship buried on Mars. Yeah. Nobody knew what the heck it was, and they take yeah. pieces off it. Yeah. And then they plant a tracking device on it. 
and they, and they follow yeah. it back to the home world and, and uh, so she says it's like the greatest archaeological mm. you know, this race they've never heard of they've discovered this new race and they go back to the home world and that's that's you know wh wh where she goes yeah. um and, and, he Sorry, and, and what she says is she's under strict orders from earth yeah. force i was going to say new that, technologies yeah. division, division yeah to keep this top secret. secret now this was uh what's this what i thought she was an archaeologist you know that, that's yeah that's yeah. what he said so what this what's this new technologies division they wouldn't be looking yeah. out for alien technology and trying to reverse engineer it well, all i can say is uh Foreign Technologies Division and uh, Colonel Corso and uh, Roswell, you know, I mean, I know, I know by 95, I think that Roswell book was just about out. And I think Corso had been speaking publicly for several years before 95. So I don't know whether I think he was necessarily told of any secret information. Um, he probably was just reading some of the literature Mm. Uh, about at the time I, I thought i'd be interested to know about the time of when some of that information came out i mean the alien autopsy film came out in 96 i think so uh he, he i think this episode would have aired in 96 but i but it, I, what i'm really driving at is that I, you yeah, know we're both interested was, in yeah. what, what no, it, was, it, it, it aired before that um yeah i think yeah but I mean, of course, there were yeah, rumours yeah. of of of, of, Ros oh, of, of course. crashes, you know, yeah, 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 the sort of um, right from when it happened, actually, from yeah. the early fifties. So I suppose what I'm interested in is how much Straczynski would have read and been interested in. Well, that's certainly something that I touched on in my previous video yeah. when I talked about this. Yeah, I mean, sure. he he was friends with Bryce uh, Bryce Abel, who who collaborated with um, Richard Dolan. You know, and and you and I but did both... that come out? You know, but what what's the time scale on that though? That's well, the the he was. It would have been after. I, I mean, it's worth pointing out that the the alien autopsy thing in in and of itself was a was a limited hangout. You know, but but certainly right. you and I know that that is covering up a, a something much more genuine. You know, you, you know what I'm saying. Um, but so that you say that was ninety seven. I think it was after. It was certainly after that. This was ninety six, yeah. The, yeah, so it, this, was, it was. This, it was about about nineteen ninety nine. Right, but so, I think he was friends with. I think he knew Bryce Sable for 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 a number right. of years before that. So I think. Yeah, he, I, mean, I, yeah. I don't know if Bryce Sable was ever. You know what? If he had, if he was some kind of CIA. CIA well, exactly. Yeah, whatever, yeah, you know? yeah. You don't, we don't but, know. Do I we? mean, there are hints in this story that all I suppose we can say really is that uh, there are hints in this story that. Straczynski or somebody that was feeding my ideas new stuff I, I, what I took from this episode was that Straczynski or whoever edited the script for this episode or, or had input into it they did probably know a little bit about you know what some of the backstory of what's been going on here because as I think probably I'm, and no doubt you picked up on this as well when you know Anna Sheridan is trying to talk uh, Sheridan into you know siding with her you know yeah. and, and getting access to the shadows technology really she doesn't quite put it like that but she says no. we have learned in the light of things in the last five years that would change earth forever imagine no more po poverty limitless cheap energy organic ships now that's an interesting one yeah I'll come back to that in, in a little bit yeah. we could leap ahead a thousand years or ten thousand years so that's quite interesting because she in in the Babylon Five world, you, they must have some type of advanced technology already, else they wouldn't have built Babylon Five, and they wouldn't have the Star Furies and all of that stuff. Because clearly, the Star Furies mm -hmm. are not are not putting gas in them, you know. So, no. you know, so but <laughs> it's it, so that's quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, so that's quite an interesting hook that Anna yeah. tries to use against yeah. you know for Sheridan to bring him in, you know. Yeah. So I, I don't I don't know maybe you picked up on that as well. Well, I know that, that there's a lot of that sort of undercurrent in the series anyway. Certainly the the Vorlons and the Mimbari would have had to work together on combining their technology yeah. beforehand because the White Star were partial partial yeah. Vorlon, partial organic ships. And you do find out that um, the whole thing on Earth with President Clark is being steered or at least helped by the shadows. Um, because the shadows run the cycle, and we see that a, an episode in season four where Mr. Morden, one of the cycle, and this politician, they're sitting there talking about the uh, President Clark's agenda. So th there's there's a clear awareness amongst some people on Earth that 
you know, that they're, they're in cahoots with the shadows. And we do see, and although this is post the shadows leaving the series, they did use their technology because they built several destroyers out of shadow technology in season four. I think there's about 10 or 12 of these big destroyers, these big ships that are like, they look like shadow ships, but they're like part hearth technology part. So that kind of comes to pass that idea that she's saying there, you know, we can build these ships that are sort of, um, it's not like into the realms of completely organic technology, but it's, it's going that way. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. And I th- yeah, and that, that whole interesting sort of element of, of the story, which is easy to miss if you haven't looked at some of the sort of UFO literature and mm-hmm. uh, some of the whistleblowers that have come out and said various things. Mm. Um, you know, people may not be familiar, and I'm not quite sure what to make of this story. I wrote this up in my book, uh, acknowledged the uh, David Adair story, where he said that he was he was asked to work on an engine which had been recovered from an alien craft. And this was when he was in his late teens or early twenties. So we're probably talking sort of late sixties, early seventies. And he described this as an organic engine. And I don't, I don't know whether his story is true because I did a bit of sort of more analysis in that book. And I think parts of his story might be true. And I think other parts are certainly not true. Yeah. I I felt that, that there was, there were little elements of it that didn't quite ring right with me, but I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. And and also this idea that that comes out in this particular story, I think. Well, well, it's kind of um, doesn't come out in this story, but it's 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 um, uh, re re it's discussed again. And this idea that Anna Sheridan, you know, Sheridan already says this is not the woman I married. She wouldn't have gone along with. She would no. never have gone along with this this agenda yeah. of the shadows. To yeah. she would never have tried to come here and sort of seduced me into coming back she wouldn't have done that she wasn't like that and of course she's behaving she she doesn't know what's wrong you know but then it turns out in this scene that she's been put in one side one, one of, of those her ships. ships yeah yeah and she's which made her the way she into, was yeah yeah she's had something plugged into her neck mm-hmm. you know and then you get into what you alluded to a couple of minutes ago where these telepaths are being used to control the ships mm-hmm. you know and um, I remember an earlier episode with this Bester, who's this head of the Psycho, played by uh, uh, Walter Koenig, 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 yeah. Koenig, Koenig yeah. sorry, from uh, Chekhov in Star Trek. And he, 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 he finds out something that he's not. I mean, he's an evil character anyway. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But but he he talks about these uh, people, these telepaths that have come, been picked up from somewhere, being weapons components. Yes, they're described yeah. on a on a manifest as weapons components, mm-hmm. and they're actually these telepaths that have been, you know, either held in say stasis or something, or imprisoned or put in a container in poor conditions or something. Mm. So so you, you know you led led to this idea of these ships being controlled by the power of thought. And then we're back to 1950 and Wilbert Smith's memo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and I, well, that was released in 1979. So, and I'd never, well, I suppose it had been, uh, there were other series. I mean, I suppose, I think that Flight of the Navigator, the Disney film, right. I think that that, that ship was controlled by, um, you know, his, his brain, wasn't it, or something? His uh, yeah, patterns or something. I do think I that mean. there there is a precedent for it, but I don't know how much it, it, it it parallels with what 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 we're talking about the the no. UFO ET uh, connection, but I do know that some of the um, like you know the, like the, the the Blavatsky stuff, the theosophical stuff, you right. know, um, yeah, yeah. John Carter of Mars and things like that, and the Lemuria legends and all that kind of thing. I know there was you know the Vril the Vril stuff, yeah, you know, the Vril stuff. There is yeah. an element of that of um, telepathic connection to technology True. and making it work. So. I mean, some of that stuff is is dated from like late nineteenth century written literature. So some of the earliest science fiction, actually. But it, it, I don't imagine that it was particularly well known that that literature. I don't think it was particularly well read anyway. No. It's only so been I suppose in years that it's been. You know, I suppose that uh, Straczynski again. He's probably well read, so he's probably familiar with a lot of that stuff. I imagine he got a lot of that from that, but um, yeah, yeah. But I, but I again, it's still it's one of those highbrow mm-hmm. concepts that these. Yeah, it is, yeah. They develop a race of telepaths in 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 you know the Babylon Five universe, um, but they're used by the shadows, or the shadow ships are controlled by the power of thought, mm. and 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 the fact that when they get in these ships, they they are essentially you know somehow changed, mm-hmm. and she, she doesn't even realise it until 
because I think in that conversation they have, you know, in this scene with Morden and Justin and Anna, um, this Justin guy says that, uh, let's see. Uh, I, I think I might have here. the dialogue, yeah. Yeah. Um, There's something about you never quite whole again, but you do as you're told. Is that the, is that the bit? No, I was thinking that she, he, he says, I've, I don't know if I wrote down the exact line, um, that, um, you know, we had a discussion with her, with Anna, but she made the wrong decision. Yeah, she, she chose poorly. Yeah, yeah. She chose poorly or something. Yeah, I forget the exact phrase. And they coerced her into, you know, to going along with them. I mean, what's worth mentioning as well is that they, the Vorlons actually created the telepaths as That's weapons right. to fight, to be able to disable and hold back the shadow or get it. So that's the other side of that sort of element of yeah. thought being able to um, uh, control organic technology. As I said, why do you yeah. think that search Bible telepaths came out of nowhere a hundred years ago? They created telepaths on a hundred worlds to use as cannon fodder for the next war. So that's uh, another element of it. But Yeah. And that again was very interesting the way that was put into the storyline that telepathy was, was engineered to a degree or enhanced, you know, within within the human race, and uh, that that's an interesting concept as well, you know. And you, this touches on something that Lloyd Pye said about the Anunnaki, you know, and he said that they created, uh, you know, not just him, but of course, came out of the Sitchin box. And I think some of this is tr probably true. I don't know how much, but Lloyd Pye, you know, pointed out the um, the, the abilities of autistic people are, are severely autistic. Wow. And the way that they can, yeah. you know, they can, um, you know, they can re, re, just look at a piece of music and play it instantly, or they can, you know, they can look at a scene of a city and then for, for one, one minute, and then they can paint the whole city, you know, over four or five hours in, in very accurate detail, you know, mm. and, 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 uh, you know, Kim, Kim Peek, who is the, um, the inspiration for Rain Man, he can memorize 95% of a telephone directory in, you know, an hour or something, you know, like hundreds of thousands of numbers and he can remember them all. And so this g gives you an insight into what the human brain is actually capable of, you know, when it's rewired slightly. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and um, Lloyd Pye made the argument that he thinks that what the alien race did is they deliberately downgraded us so we wouldn't have their mental capacity you know, or, or mental abilities or psychic abilities, perhaps. And that, again, is, you know, what, what's what's sort of alluded to in this story, I, which I, I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I've, I've always maintained that I, I've got no solid evidence of it, but I've always maintained that I think there was a point in time where, where you know, humanity had far more in the way of readily, easily usable, readily available, accessible, commonplace um, psychic abilities, you know, telepathy, mm -hmm. telekinesis, all that kind of thing. I, I don't, you know, who can say why that has, I, I still think it's there. I mean, maybe it's just, it is, yeah. it's not used that we've become sort of like, um, it's like a muscle that doesn't get exercised, you know? Um, yeah. But I think there's more to it than that as well. Like you say. Yeah, and I mean, again, the, these themes are not, not exactly new in science fiction or no, no, of course not. In, 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 in other uh, genres, but you know, I, I immediately think of the Tomorrow People from the 1970s, probably a bit before your time. But I was very taken with that series when that was on in the yeah, I've already watched it. I've, I was, it was a bit, um, I was a bit young, but I have watched it in more recent yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was you know, it was a kids' show more than anything, and I think it was sort of fairly cheaply made, but um, had some good ideas kind of, in it though. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. it did. And I read the books, and I. Uh, read the um i read the books and i watched all the episodes and i was a big fan of that that show and um there was a glut know. of shows uh, actually at that time books that yeah shows that were based on books as well things i remember you know like chalky and things like that uh, yeah that was a bit later i never saw that until recently hmm. somebody dumped it on youtube yeah yeah that was another very really similar thing you know this sort of psychic ability and connection all that kind of stuff and that's right yeah. That's right. Yeah, anybody that's interested in that sort of thing, watch the Chalky series. You know, it was mm. on YouTube. I don't it's think a good watch, yeah. yeah. It is. It's very, very good. And particularly, this is clearly a children's series and made as a children's series. It's still very well made, you know. And uh, there's, it's, there's, it's, uh, it's crazy to think that the television that they were making for children back then, comparing it to the television that they make for adults nowadays, it's that's, that's even, that's more... You know, uh, we reached the lowest common denominator in so Sometimes, many ways nowadays. Yeah. 
yeah. you really have yeah. it's pandering to the the yeah don't get me started that one because i've i've discussed that many many times on this yeah. channel the way you know with the whole sort of sjw agenda social justice warrior thing right. in infiltrating the media polluting it destruction of the past you know the, the cultural mythology and all that kind of thing but anyway that's that's a discussion for another time so <laughs> yeah i mean that, that that whole you know that side of what's actually happening you can see if you watch this episode that's there in other words if if we if we look at what the way that people's minds are working now and what's happening to people's minds it almost is like there is some you know alien program going on to infiltrate people's brains you know not just you know but the governments but the minds of people yeah like i mean they flicked a switch almost you know in the last year i can't to, get into it too much here i think i mean you and i have talked privately um about some of my contacts in the media oh yeah um i have to be very very careful what i say obviously because i can't divulge what certainly one of my contacts has worked at the, the field that they've worked in but there is a um this thing that's discussed you know the the message and the signal as they call it which is you you get into the realms of actual transmittable signals yeah. the technology which it just completely and people would say well, that's just science fiction yeah this is real yeah. this is real stuff energy and consciousness you know uh, transmissions that are fundamentally reshaping people's entire mental landscape yeah and they yeah. don't know what they don't recognize what's going on so you have to wonder if is if this if this is wide scale if that if if that is the reason why so many people have have are, are starting to you know have certainly reacted the way they have to um the coof you know um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that a part of it? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, I've I've completely gone off track with my notes because, uh, but I think we've covered. Um, I don't think is there much more to say about Zahadun, really. There's a couple of things. Yeah, a, a couple of things I wanted I've, to add. Yeah, um, I've skipped over some notes here actually. No, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. Um, because there's they're, they're they're talking about you know the, this is good because the shadows reveal their agenda. Oh yes, the agenda, and, of course. And, yeah. and, and I think what what became clear to me is that you, you kind of think you get on their side a little bit. Because they're just saying, well, you know, we're only doing what the Vorlons are doing, but, you know, we're just doing it for different reasons. You know, and they talk about wanting to promote conflict, you know, so that the, 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 the races will grow and evolve and become stronger. That's their line of argument, isn't it? They say that, well, we, we want to bring these races into conflict so that they, you know, a few of them die off, but what emerges evolves and is stronger, you know. And I think what was interesting 
the, was uh, on that part of this script was what wasn't said. You know, they didn't. The, the Justin figure said all of that, but he didn't say we want to create order from chaos. You well, know, there, there is a balance because they do actually say uh, um, the Vorlons are like lords of order, and yeah. and they and the Shad and Justin does say we create chaos. That's that's our side of it. So it is order versus chaos. It's, yeah. it's that. That's not said explicitly, is it? It's not said explicitly. Yeah, but it's, no, it's not it's said pretty explicitly, close. but it's close, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, they, and he also says that this is where we go back to this idea of destiny again, because they explain that they want Sheridan because he's a nexus. Yeah. He says, um, you know, we can see that with you, you know, if if, if you, you know, the, the, because of the work, what you're doing and the way you're doing it, the whole world might go along with you. With and you. if it does, yeah. 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 you know, it's going to be much harder for us to do what we want. Yeah. Yeah, it's like stop fighting us. We, you know, yeah. let go, let go of those races. You can't help them. You know, evolution will be served. He says, which in itself yeah. is a bit of a weird one the way he puts that. But you know, it's like um, let let them die off. You know, the, the, you you can be the one. You can be riding out of this stronger, better. You know, riding on top sort of thing. At the, the next out of the next war. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, and they're, they're saying, "Well, come and work with us." You know, but mm. they are dishonest. You know, that that's the thing that. They're, they're ultimately deceptive in what they say because, you know, they present Anna as being... Well, that's the lie you know, that, yeah, they, they present her as being the same Anna, Anna that he's always known yeah, and she isn't. Yeah. yeah and I mean, then, and they could basically say it's a lie of omission, no, we, we, but it's still a lie. Yeah, that we're, we're actually, Anna, you know, I'm sorry, you're not because we cursed you. Yeah, yeah. You know? So they're lying yeah, and I think... They're that, lying, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that I think is, um, you know... I mean, are the Vorlons lying as well? Well, I suppose maybe you could say the Vorlons it, it, are lying. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, you can see that the shadows uh, have a darker agenda. They don't really want to help anybody. They're, they're just no. out for themselves. Whereas the Vorlons, they do, I think they do want to help people. They're not particularly interested in, you know, g getting anything out of the humans. I don't know. You know? I mean, I... I not not to be contrary or anything like that, but I've always taken it away from it as this is not to say that the Vorlons aren't, you know, got this higher goal in mind and all that. But I think ultimately they see a status quo that mm. they want to maintain. So mm. therefore they use the younger races to, to keep that status quo the way it is. Mm. They don't want mm. the order. They don't want the chaos. They just want the ballot that, you know, the um Obviously, yeah. they want to be right, you know, on the moral high ground compared to the shadows, but they don't want to turn everything upside down and that. They just, you know, um, and they also lied in as much as they never told all the other races that they'd created telepaths and things like that as weapons to fight the shadows. Um, so they didn't know that until the shadows told them. So it's, it, I kind of see it as six of one and half a dozen of the other. That that's my perspective. Yeah, on it anyway. yeah, yeah. yeah. I I agree. You know, and uh, I just think I don't know. I suppose because of the um, people we are, you know, we we know, you know, that the Vorlans are manipulating manipulating the humans as well. But they seem to be doing it for better reasons than the shadows are. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I would say that there's there, there's more of a nobility to it. There's more of a um, yeah, yeah yeah noble is a good word. It's a more noble. Kind yeah. of position that they have, yeah, you yeah. know. Um, but yeah, I think just what was said at the end of that episode is it's as, as the for the closing credits where Jakar, who's the non character, that's a he, great piece of narration, isn't it? That is, yeah, it is. And he says, uh, you know, how they close the series, I suppose, there is a greater darkness than the one we fight, it is the darkness of a soul that has lost its way, and that is. Mm -hmm. is darkness of a soul yeah. that has lost its way what you know think about that everybody yeah. the war we fight is not against powers and principalities it is against chaos, chaos. and despair yeah. greater than the death of flesh is the death, death of, of hope, hope death of dreams against this peril we can sounds never like 2020 surrender. doesn't it <laughs> well, this is it you know the, what, what else can you think of <laughs> yeah, at this yeah, time yeah. when you're reading this mm -hmm. you know death of hope death of dreams the future is all around us, waiting in moments of transition to be born in moments of revelation. Yeah. No one knows the shape of the that future or where it will take us, only that it is always born in pain. pain yeah. You know, so that it's again a great is... great piece uh, of dialogue. Yeah, is, yeah, it is. I mean, I don't know who wrote that, whether it's him, but, you know, this is this is written by somebody who has a very uh, you know, good knowledge oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. of the human condition. 
you know, and, yeah. and, and, uh, I know he studied psychology at, um, college yeah. and all I mean, that. And I'd read that, yeah, yeah. I remember when I was watching Babylon five and it, it was the early days of the internet. And I was, there was this thing called the lurkers guide to Babylon five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I, you know, and if you ever looked at that back in the day, it's still lurking around, believe it or not. Probably would not be, yeah. on I'm, the internet, you can go back and cause I've used it a lot for research to go back and read over things. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, um, I, I remember reading something on that that he based it on Jung a lot of this, you know. Yeah, Jungian archetypes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so you know, maybe that's all come out of that. But uh, yeah, but that I thought was a great ending to that series, and yeah, uh, very much so. Very, very powerful uh, words, you know. And I suppose again, it, you could apply it to what Second World War or well, yeah, yeah. Conflicts, we, you know, we say this is, it isn't just exclusive to now. I think it's no, because it's. No because we are in the thick of it now at the moment, yeah. that it has so much resonance. This, this, this is moment our second world war, really. This is, our, this know, is yeah, this is ours now. Yeah. And people might say, oh, you're really over-exaggerating that. But no, yeah. it's just, it is war. it's, it's uh, like I said before, it's, it's, it's almost like it's the Vorlon's ways, way of doing it instead of the Shadow's way of doing it. Yeah. It's about psychology and fear as opposed yeah. to actual, um, actual outright death and guns and death yeah. and, you know, that kind of, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, just, I'm sure there are other things I can think of with that episode, but I was, unless there's anything else you wanted to say, I'm, oh yeah, there is one thing. Mm. This is a bit sort of esoteric, maybe a bit occult for some people. I don't know, but um, you do have to look into all of these subjects if you want to get sort of a, a broader perspective on the bigger picture of the, you know, the world and reality and existence, all that kind of thing. But this, the imagery of the jumping into the abyss, at the end, you know, jumping into the darkness, you know, jump, jump now. And it's very much like the sort of um, the, the long, not the long dark night of the soul kind of thing, you know, um, in, again, that's all Jungian stuff, you know, but I know it's, it's like sort of in alchemical stuff and all that and esoteric stuff and the occult as well, this idea of, you know, you go through the, the this journey and then you reach the point where you have to cast off the ego. You have to sort of go into the nothingness before you can come out the, I mean, even in modern psychology, you've got this idea of um, uh, what's it called? Um, liminalism, you know, where you, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, this idea where you reach a, a space that's um, dark, artificial, no lat natural light. And it creates this sense of angst and anxiety in you. And you can't find your way out of it because the route that you came in is gone and there's no route foreseeable. It's almost like a, a, a darkly lit neon lit, hotel corridor that's got no exit and you're just walking just looking for the exit and you can't and people have said that that, that, that everything that's going on in the world is is based on the the, the principles of limit, liminalism at the moment you know but i i think i thought that and if you follow that even further into the beginning of season four where what he finds at the bottom of that abyss when he meets Lorian, the first one the, you know the original first one the older than the shadows and the vault you know you're really getting into esoteric stuff then because he basically says to him you're dead you know, you're stuck between tick and tock. You have to choose now whether you, you, you've got to cast off all that you were before and in, and it's everything that's in front of you now moving forward kind of thing. And again, those are really quite profound themes, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of it comes yeah. from Jungian archetypes and that, but of course it's, you know, it's there. So I thought that was fascinating as well, that idea of just, you know, the unknown, jumping into the unknown. Right at that. He doesn't know what's underneath Absolutely. him. He doesn't know if he's going to die or not. You know, he's just, you know. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's you know it leads into the next sort of stage really, but yeah, it is. It's a really good episode. Yeah. Um, so intersections in real time. Mm. Really brief plot synopsis for this one. Sheridan is captured by President Clark's forces, and he's betrayed by Garibaldi at that point in the series. But we find out there's a much bigger story to that, and he's imprisoned in a dark room. There he is interrogated and tortured to force him to admit that he was under the influence of aliens whose goal it was, was to undermine earth and that he was basically working for them. And it's, it is a, it's a harrowing episode. It really mm. is. It's got themes of the nature of truth, perceptions of reality, control and conformity, uh, the need and, and the right to freedom as well, in, in, inalienable in every human being, you know, uh, it really does hit all the, all the balls on this one. It does, you know, so I don't know if you want to start with this. I've, yeah, I mean, I think it's really just, as you say, it's quite a visceral episode. And um, I think there's only really two or three speaking parts in the whole 
40 and it's odd minutes. set in a no. dark I mean yeah. it must have been a really cheap episode to make because it yeah. the set is just yeah. it's like you know <laughs> it is yeah <laughs> nothing to it is it, it you know it's, I mean you know you could sort of um, just say oh you know this is just the same as a torture scene from a World War Two film yeah. or something similar, it's like you know. Room 101 in, in 1984 as well yeah, and, yeah you know, I mean you so could it's been see done many of, times but yeah 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 exactly but there's, a, there's probably a couple of additional, additional elements to it and as as uh, you know i picked out a few bits of the dialogue where the the interrogator comes in you know and he says um resistance will be punished cooperation will be rewarded Ordered, yeah. you know and uh, again <laughs> what's happening now now folks you know yeah yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. or you know the threats of um yeah. I mean, he and says to him, he, you, you will, you will, when I ask a question, you will respond at once. You will not hesitate. You will not consider. You will not lie. Cooperation will be rewarded. Resistance will be. Yeah, exactly. It is. Mm-hmm. It is now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it really is. And, um, and I know, um, just again, dwelling on this idea of torture, the amazing Polly did this video where she. Oh, it's a great channel. We're, through, we're checking yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. She talked about how what's been happening is, is it's torture, basically, if you look at it. If you look mm-hmm. at what torture is defined as, and that that's what people have been people have been tortured on a mass scale. You know? And we talk about people's freedoms and right to right to be able to express themselves being taken away from them. I think I might be right wrong in thinking this, but amongst those, you know, amazing Polly is another one was deplatformed from YouTube, wasn't she? I, I was, she was, I yeah, yeah, yeah. That plan was, you know, the, yeah, just speaking was the, speaking the truth, you know, putting evidence yeah. out there and yeah. telling it yeah. like it is. Yeah. yeah, that's right, that's right. So there you are, you know. Yeah, yeah resistance will be punished you know yeah right there. exactly that, yeah, yeah dave cullen and uh yeah know. dave cullen uk cullen now as well you know and um, and there's yeah. lots of other channels that have you know um had strikes against them told them they can't upload i mean you've had yeah. something happen in the last 24 hours haven't yeah you, i had well, one deleted you know, so. today yeah just yeah, yeah. it's been up for about a year yeah grown and stuff you know so yeah. yeah i mean the amount of times i've put stuff on social media and it's just been flagged as um you know fact check and then removed mm-hmm. or whatever so yeah yeah but anyway yeah let's carry on with the uh, <laughs> yeah 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 and then he talks about um you know he switches the light on and off outside the door and mm. you know he says oh that's the, now it's night now it's day so you know and, and then he gives him a sandwich and so you can't have this because it's lunch it's breakfast time not lunch time because it's yeah. not, it's just so can just i just read that sort of can i just read that little bit of dialogue out mm. because it's just why not it's just for our viewers to to, re- to really think about this this is this is what the torturer says to Sheridan. Everything is a matter of perspective. You seem to think it's daylight. You assume it's morning. Take it away. You think it's night. Offer you a sandwich. It's conven- If it's convenient, you'll think it's midday. The truth is fluid. The truth is subjective. Mm-hmm. In here, it's lunchtime. If you and I decide that it is, the truth is something that you believe it is to be and other times what you decide it to be. My task is to make you to decide to believe differently. And when that happens, the world will remake itself before your very eyes. It all depends on what you believe and what other people tell you to believe. That is, that's, that's and fucking I, good stuff. Excuse my language. <laughs> it, it really is. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it, it kind of is like that, but then I thought about that and I thought, yeah, he's kind of right. But then I thought, actually, if you look at the scene, that Sheridan is in, the interrogator is controlling much of Sheridan's reality mm-hmm. because he's he is, present. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, although he says that, and in some ways it's true, but in the circumstances it's not true because no, it's, he's it's, it's, in control it's, of Sheridan's yeah, reality. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's him that switched the light on and off. It wasn't Sheridan that no, decided it. No, 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 no. Re- Sheridan's reality no. is still what very much what he wants it to be. Although he really goes through the gamut of it and questions it. Um, but we will come to one of my absolute favorite lines, and I carry this through my life with me. I will come to it shortly, but um, I won't spoil it now at this point. But it's a fantastic mm-hmm. line. He reasserts his reality at the end and says, You know, whatever yeah. you do to me, you know, and I, that's that's great. That really is, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I'm kind of thinking about that Outer Limits episode, you know, control experiment, you know, it's almost like that. The, the parameters are being controlled by it. I mean, of course there's that classic episode the twilight zone as well you know the um the power goes out in the in the street and they think it's all 
Yeah, Monsters and of Monsters of Maple, Maple, Maple Street. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know why I forgot that. It's one of my favourites. We've got Freudian slip there with the title on it, but yeah, <laughs> but that's another example. You know, it's it's externally controlled. You know, you you think you've got control over the circumstances, but so no, it's. But you're right. Yeah, it it is the torturer that's doing this. I don't think he's even got mm. a name in the episode, has he? I think he's just. No, I don't I think, think he has a name. name. He's yeah. just the interrogator, isn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and and um, you know, he, in one sense, you know, he makes a, a, a sort of slightly different point, and you can see that in some ways, you know, what he says is is true because he then talks about Sheridan fighting them in Bari, uh, but then you know they're, they're, that so they were the the enemy, but mm. then later on, they're you know they're the yeah. uh, friends, you know, yeah. Because um, he asks course, him at one point if if you've ever been influenced by people, mm. and he says no, and he says really. He said, I can't possibly, you know, are you that far detached from the world? You know, we're all influenced. You know, you're in the office and someone's in a bad mood. Pretty much everyone's in a bad mood. And, he, and he's right. But yeah. um, I think the point that Sheridan was trying to make is not on the level that you're employing. Of course, we're mm. all influenced on a day to day basis. But mm. ultimately, we have our own. We, we have our line that we don't cross. We have our point where, you know, the, no, this is this is very much me. This is not what other people have made me believe or think or whatever. Um, you know, th there's a point where it comes down to a basic right or wrong choice. You know, I'm not going along with that because it's wrong or I'm going along with that because it's right, you know, and that's so, yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah. And then that, you know, Sheridan isn't really given a chance to respond. And of course, no, he isn't. No, no. you know, yes. You know, your situation changes uh, and, you know, what we thought 15 years ago was true, 20 years ago was true, you know, yeah, yeah, we absolutely. no longer understand it as being true because mm. we've got new information. That's right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, Sheridan yeah. isn't isn't given a chance to respond and so that's not developed. Mm. So I think, you know, it's worth remembering that though what it said there is true, that, you know, your truth changes, the truth changes. Oh, tr truth very much is fluid in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. But, it, but really, it's because what you believed before wasn't actually true because exactly. you didn't have yeah, yeah, yeah. information. Yeah. So you only thought it was true. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, you, you and know, he, you he, Sheridan does this in the in the whole series because first off, when you see him, he's very much against them in Bari. He fought them in the war and that. But then, through information, through through knowledge. He learned that the reason why they ended the war was because the souls were migrating into humans and that. He also has encounters, you know, he meets Delenn and he encounters her and sees her way of, so, you know, he's, his knowledge, of, and also he gets the, the story of the bigger picture with the shadows as well. So he has more information. So he, he can't have that position anymore then at that point because he's moved into a new territory in terms of what he knows, hasn't he? So, he's, so okay. his truth has yeah. changed then. He was wrong before yeah. and now he knows differently, you know. Yeah. So, you know, you got to, you know, can't just think of it on one level, really. No, I think no, no, that's no. Why, no. Again, you sort of into pretty highbrow concepts that mm -hmm. a lot of people don't don't think about, you know, so. No, 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 no. But, it, I mean, it does play on that very, on, on the Room 101 thing and mm, and, yeah. and other things yeah. that we've talked about, you know, the, the lines like, a, you have no rights, there's no courtroom here, no tribunals, no attorneys, that was the one. Yeah. no justice, yeah. no mercy, no fairness, no hope, no last minute escape. You will walk through that door when you confess and not one second before. And it's great stuff. It puts puts the hairs up on the back. And, and, you've, and you've almost got these, like, the prisoner esque type moments as well where yeah. they bring the drazi prisoner in and uh you know you think he's being tortured as well and he says to him sheridan says to him i know that you feel like they've won but as long as you they don't break you inside that you can't they can't win you bend but you don't break the ones that have done this to you they're the ones that are broken you can fight this you can refuse you can say you know the moment you surrender you become expendable we're all afraid but don't give them what they want. And mm -hmm. you, you, you really feel for this Drazi and you feel for Sheridan as well. And then at the end of the episode, when they, they say to Sheridan, right, this is, your, this is it now, you, you're going to die. And they take him out on this gurney and they take him into another room and you see a, blo a, a, a figure there with like a black cowl on a hood and all that. Mm -hmm. The executioner, you think, you know, because it's that kind of imagery. Mm -hmm. And then they just like turn the thing, bed into like a desk. And then another yeah. one, it's all started over again. And the, the, you know, the, he pulls the hood off and it's the Drazi. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, 
smirks at him. It's really like almost like the prisoner twisted yeah. perceptions of reality. Yeah. The games they're playing with him, you know, that yeah. Everything is a matter of perspective, yeah. you know, it's I think I think what I took from that you know, outburst of the interrogator is he kind of reveal I reveals his true, you know, um attitude really i mean he's mm. not sure he sort of tries to pretend that he's there to help sheridan you know yeah, just got to get this confession yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and you know i can save your life but uh then he says no actually it's got nothing to you know there are yeah. no rights etc no, right. yeah so that reveals the true agenda that this is a dark agenda they don't yeah. they're not interested in the truth they're interested in their own yeah you know aspirations yeah they just want to further their own agenda they're not interested in anything else but the twist, you know? the twist of it, as again, I know we keep coming back to it, but it's like mm. as what's going on in the world now, you know, mm. and the, the, the interrogator or torture, whatever you want to call him, he says to Sheridan, he says, I'm not keeping you here. They're not keeping yeah. you here. You're keeping you here. Yeah. Um, we're, we're our own jailers, folks. You know, yeah. we're as free as we want to be. And that really brings me to that. What I will just quickly say it, that that bit of dialogue with Sheridan. Because it, it it's, I remember the first time I ever saw it and it's stuck in my mind all my life. And I, I use it as a, as a mantra in life. He says, it's funny. I was thinking about what you said. The preeminent truth of our age is that we cannot beat the system. But if, if you say the truth is fluid, that the truth is subjective, then maybe you can fight the system as long as just one person refuses to be broken, refuses to bow down. And the, and the chap says to him, but can you win? And he says, every time I say no. And that, I carry that mantra through life with me. You know, if there ever comes a point where I feel something is, you know, it is my, it is my right. It's everybody's right um, to say no. Yeah. You know, and, and what really bothers me is that, that that word, the word no, it's so powerful and yet so few people seem to want to use it these days. It's, it's one of the yeah. most powerful things you have in life. It's a tool, it's a weapon, it can be whatever you want it to be. But it is, it is your doorway to, to, the, to the freedom that we, we're all entitled to, if we want it. And it's funny, you know, you have that expression, you know, oh, is this, this organisation is full of yes men. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's meant to be positive, isn't it? But <laughs> when you use it like that, you realise it's yes, men aren't positive at all. No, no. They're the ones that help to create, you know, most of the problems. Yeah. I mean, so, yes can be a good thing if you can help somebody and you, it's right, within it's your context. power and you say, yes, it's context, of course. But but it's a very different thing when it comes to, you know, that mm. point of being able to mm. say no is our is our... You know, if you're a religious person, it's your God given right. If, you, if you're secular, you know, it's your, it's your inalienable human right. You know, it's it's whatever it needs. But we all have that right, whatever our perspective on the world. Um, you know, we all have that right to say no. If we feel we're being compromised in any way, shape or form that, you know, that it's it's not on, you know, then then that's. But, yeah, it's great. It's a wonderful moment. It's one of my favorites. And, um, you know, it's, I really hold it up there in very, very high regard that moment. Cause it's, it's mm. just, um, it's so powerful. It's one of those real fantastic moments of, of anything I've ever watched in, in actual fact, you know, it's yeah. I mean, there's a couple of other lines in that as well, where he says, uh, Sheridan says, Oh, we're all afraid. And this is when he's talking to the drawers. Mm -hmm. We're all afraid. Don't give them what they want. But yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't you know, give them what they want. Yeah. You just have to say, no, I won't one more time. Then, they say, say yes, yes you, you will. Do. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? Yeah, that's all so, it is. That's yeah. all it is. It's a battle of yeah. wills. It really yeah. is. Just comes down to a battle of wills. It's yeah. how many more times are you willing to say no than they're willing to say, you know, no, I won't, than they're willing to say yes, you will. Yeah, yeah. And 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 also outlined in in part of the dialogue is why they go after prominent people. Mm. Uh, you know, like anybody that, that that sticks up and says no. You know, he, he, the interrogator says to Sheridan, the problem is when a war hero, you know, you can substitute war hero for, you know, major celebrity or you know, scientist or, or public figure of note. Yeah, you know, anybody who has the hero, ability to reach people. Yeah, yeah. Right. Starts believing certain things and saying certain things. The public listens. They figure maybe there's something to it. <coughs> Your credibility has become a threat to their credibility. So one of them has to go. Yeah, yeah. 
and, yeah. and I wondered yeah. watching that episode if if the interrogator himself had been threatened because or whether that was just fake emotion. Yeah. yeah. And that if yeah, he yeah. couldn't break Sheridan, he you know he said he's expendable in the yeah. in the dialogue, didn't he? So whether whether he was then afraid that he was going to be killed off because he hadn't broken Sheridan, mm. and that was. You know, that was where he was saying, well, if, you know, I admit that if you win this, you know, I'm going I'm to have to go, you mm. know. I mean, it could be, it could be a false empathy. Um, could be. I mean, certainly yeah, if you look, really I mean, I've, I've read a lot of psychology and I'm not, a, I'm not a degree carrying person or anything. I just, an interest of mine, you know, I've read a lot of psychology texts and things like that. I'm fascinated in the human mind, the way it works and that. And if you look at like the psychology of torture and things like that, mm. it is quite a common thing that you, you know, you have to, um, you know, the the, the, the the tortured almost becomes sort of enamoured by their torture, you know, because of that relatability, that empathy, you know, that they, it's false, of course, there's a goal behind it, you know, it's to get what they want. But um, yeah, that's why we have this thing today of, um, you know, it's, it's, do, do you want to, do you want people to die, you know, you, all this crap, you know, is it, we're keeping you safe kind of, it's that, it's that emotional blackmail effectively, you know, it's psychological mm. Yeah. Um, psychological warfare effectively yeah yeah absolutely and there's another interesting line near near the end of that episode where you know they, they he, he you know he's got the confession on the table and they want him to sign it and he sort of you know you can see it written on his face he th- kind of thinks about signing it because of mm. the torture but then he obviously says oh, i can't do that yeah you know I'm, that would that's not you know i'm not going to do it mm-hmm. and uh then the the interrogator says whether whether your confession is true or not doesn't matter yeah. as long as they can sell it to the public. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So again, they're yeah. not interested. No, no. They're that resonates interested. with what we were talking in our previous yeah. video about bumping people yeah. off and things like that. It doesn't. It isn't yeah. ne- always necessary to have no. that figure that actually because he does say to him, "It's better if we've got you out there. People can see you, yeah. and you actually, you know, look like you mean it. You know, when you confess and all that kind of thing. But we don't have to go down that route if necessary." You know, your image and your signature can be forged. You know, we can even make it look like you're, mm. re, you know, but yeah. So, you know, th- those things are all explained. And then he also says in part of the dialogue, well, you know, if you do, um, you know, confess, but one, you know, once that's great, but once you've faded into the background, you know, everybody's forgotten who you are. They'll, yeah. they'll probably just come and kill They'll you. come in the night and it'll be quick yeah. and you won't know and all this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll want you so, out there. They'll encourage you to travel so you can be seen all yeah, that, you know. We'll give you a bit right. of time, like, you know. Yeah. 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 So, you know, <laughs> yeah. no, no secrets about his tactics. No, no, not at all. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it does. It also mirrors in Zahadun where Justin says to him, you know, you're a nexus. Your people will move with you kind of thing. They, they there, There is something to Sheridan. Mm-hmm. He is one of those mm-hmm. people that people do listen to and people do go, Hang on a minute, he might. He, he's right about this. You know, we we hadn't thought about this before. We can see, like, when he's telling people, you know, this what's going on on Earth with President Clark, it's got to stop. You know, it's got to stop. We've got to find a way to stop it. And initially, there's a real pushback against it. But as time goes on, certainly when you see them taking off with the fleet to try and go back and take reclaim the colonies and all that, more and more of them join them on the way, don't they? You know, till eventually they've got a real big, massive, fl- and all the alien races join them. And say, you know, we're, we're yeah, we recognise that this has got to stop. It's, you know, it's all about coming together. We're all different voices. We've all got our different, um, you know, cultural beliefs and all this kind of thing. The different alien races, but we can recognise tyranny when we see it, and how it's got to be stopped. You know, so they 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 put their differences aside and they all work together. You know, yeah, good message. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, is there anything else that we wanted to uh, cover? No, I think, you know, we've, again, we've come up with a lot of similar through the points. Lot of yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think we both agree that, you know, the themes that come up are very, very, you know, current. And, mm. um, Absolutely. You know, are ones that we hope people will think about very carefully and uh, consider what the characters are, mm-hmm. you know, coming out with and what, what they're trying to explain to you about, you know, the forces of good and evil. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. it's very, very, that's a whole theme in, in Babylon 5 is the forces of good and evil. And, you know, you start off where the, the, you've, there's a vague notion and then 
you know, the, the, it becomes clearer and clearer what the forces of good and evil are. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, that also, in one sense, you know, you, like Sheridan symbolizes that, yeah, you, you know, okay, you, you know, you, you want to work with the good people, but the good people may want to write, kind of dominate you a bit too much. So although, you know, you're thankful that they're helping you, mm. you might not want to accept all that's on offer because, you know, they might then sort of want to um, limit your freedoms or limit your growth yeah, yeah. For, their, for their own reasons. And you want to be free of that as well. And I think that comes out a bit in the story of Babylon 5. Mm. So the same, the same goes for what's happening now in that there are, you know, apparent forces of good working for you but uh, you know, again, are they are they being opportunistic in wanting to further their own agenda? And they're not exactly evil, but they're still wanting to you know take advantage of you because you're in a worse state than they are. You know, yeah, yeah, kind of thing. I see a lot of this with the SJW thing. It's very much mm. sort of um, mm. that uh, on its surface. I mean, of course, nobody wants racism in the world. No one wants no. Uh, no. homophobia and. Um, sexual inequalities exactly all that kind of thing but um so much of what's being done now is is virtue signaling it's um disingenuous it's it's coming from a place of well certainly at the at the high end of it it's coming from a place of politics money power it's it, it's not being done for the, any good reason no. any noble reason and no. then further down the chain you obviously have a lot of people who support in these movements they don't know any better. They genuinely do believe that they are, it's a good cause, and it's and it is. But it's just the way it's being done, the way it's being gone about. That, is, you know, my gauge, right. my gauge is exactly my gauge is: is there any deception going on here? Oh, well, I think I, I think so much of it is being stage managed. That's right. So, that. No, no. I mean, I mean, th what I mean is that these people with a, with apparently a good agenda. When you study it, how much deception are they involved in? Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and um, th 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 that 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 I think is when there's a lot of deception going on, you know, that is a dark agenda. Mm -hmm. So you you look at you have to look at where the deception is, you know. It is and the I, danger. Sorry, gone. Yeah, and that's that's something which I don't think is necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, Sher Sheridan never says to these shadow people, these shadows, you're just a bunch of total liars. And I, you know, that's why I'm not going to go along with you. He never says that. No, you know? no. And no. I don't think that's said by any of the other characters. No. So that's something that I personally would have tried to get into the dialogue. I, I, I agree with you. Know, you. Yeah, completely. Like yeah, yeah. I mean, it does come up in that interrogator episode a bit. Mm. But, um, you know, I think, I think, um, Sheridan doesn't say, well, you're just, just a total liar. You know, you lied about that. He's not given a chance to respond to these accusations of who's telling the truth and who's, who's lying. Mm -hmm. or he does a little bit, but I suppose because of the state he's in, he's not, you know, he wouldn't have done that anyway. But I think that's, that's to me, a guiding principle is what, where's the deception? Is somebody yeah. trying to deceive yeah. me here? Yeah, and yeah. that's how I think is a very good way to detect what is the dark agenda and what is the light absolutely. agenda. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. What, is, yeah, what yeah. is really working for the true freedom of the spirit and what isn't, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. You sometimes in life come across something that you think, uh, uh, on the surface, I, I agree with that. And there, there, yeah. there seems to be some noble goals behind this. And then as you look deeper, you realise that there's, there are agendas there and there are deception. there are lies and there is yeah. deception, yeah. And I think, I mean, somebody very close to me many, many years ago has passed on now but said to me um you know the best movement is a movement of one and mm -hmm. um I, I do tend to think that although each individual in tandem with the mass of humanity is where we win ultimately but we still have to stay true to our individual principles and our and our individual um understanding of what's true and what's not and i think if you just start bundling people in together in movements so you and i have both had similar perception uh, perspectives on this notion of movements and things like that. It can be a very, very dangerous thing. It's so easy to lead people. And then you find that eventually everybody involved apart from one or two people at the top or a handful of people, no one's, you know, in it for the right reasons anymore. So I think you have to operate from it, from your individual perspective first off and what, what you learn as you go along, you know, what you see as the lies. Yeah. That should be what That's informs right. your, your, your journey forward. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah.
It's been a fascinating discussion. It really, really has. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to bring to the table. Before no, I we think I'd, you know, I've end. gone down my list of stuff and I think, yeah, we've, we've covered that and you've added some things as well, which, you know, were very similar to what I'd picked up on, but you've added a bit of uh, dimension to those points as well. So that's good. Yeah. Thanks. It's, it's amazing how much this is a real uh, thought provoker, you know, it is insightful and it's, it's a good conversation inducer, you know, um, I hope, encourage yeah, people very to much do, yeah. to do, to watch Babylon five, because I think, um, if you're not in a position to recognize the reality of the world outside around you or, or, you know, you've been blindsided by what you've seen on television or on social media or in the newspapers or whatever. Um, if nothing else, these types of shows can really, you know, they can really inspire some thinking outside the box inside your head. And then maybe you can go away from it afterwards. It's something that's happened to me in my life. You can go away from it afterwards and it, it can change your perspective if nothing else you can say well this is a world that's is not the world that i want to you know fictionally you'll see you'll recognize a world that you don't want to live in so i want to make sure that that kind of world never manifests itself in the real world so i want to make sure i can do everything i can to make sure that that does that i never have to live in the dystopia or a, a ty tyranny tyrannical nightmare or whatever um so if nothing else these kind of shows and films you know there's plenty of films to do it as well can give you a good perspective on the world and point you in the right direction, if nothing else. So I think if, if nothing else that people take away from this, uh, hopefully there will be people who are informed about some of the things that we've talked about. So it'll give them something more to think about as well. But even if you haven't, even if you're just somebody like science fiction, you know, I, I really do hope that, that what Andrew and I have put out here today will, will give you something much more to um, mm. a broader perspective on things. Yeah. That, that can only be a good thing. That absolutely can only be a good thing. So I will just say thank you so much, Andrew, for joining me again. Um, it's, it's been brilliant. I've really enjoyed it. It's been really thoughtful as well. Um, we did talk about doing some more. Hopefully we will. I mean, obviously, you've got a lot going on at the moment. But, you know, whenever you're free, if you want to do some more, we'll... Yeah, we can do some more of these, Carl, no yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. interesting to sort of go a bit deeper in some mm -hmm. of the themes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's plenty of things that we can... I'm sure there's a list as long as my arm of things I can think about that we can, uh, we can pull out the hat and watch and talk about. So, yeah um so i'll just say for now thank you for uh, yet again after the last video we did andrew we had a, a a number of new subscribers coming come into the channel and views have gone up a bit i really appreciate that if you're watching this on andrew's channel when it goes out that's great fantastic great for support for andrew but if you're not you know don't forget there's also my channel as well well it'll be there as well come over and even if you just give it a, a thumb up or a click you know so youtube knows that it's been noted <laughs> um so for now i'll just say thank you so much hope you've enjoyed this and uh, you will see, and hopefully Andrew as well, very, very soon. Take care for now. Bye-bye.